You're in touch with Metro Detroit's 10 o'clock news. Good evening and a happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. Amir Mason has this evening off. Tonight, an important Michigan labor leader has suddenly died, leaving union leadership wondering what next. That story in just a moment. But first tonight, two new startling developments in the widening scandal over that White House arms deal with Iran and the connection to Contra rebels in Nicaragua. The FBI is expanding its investigation to include a possible cover-up. The Los Angeles Times reporting that former National Security Council advisor Oliver North shredded key documents which may have incriminated himself and other people in the administration. The White House has admitted that North arranged for the U.S.-backed Contras to receive millions of dollars in profits from that secret arms sale to Iran. There are also reports tonight from the United Press International implicating one of the top figures in the White House chain of command. UPI says Chief of Staff Donald Regan not only knew about the Nicaragua funding plan, but authorized the scheme and held several meetings on how to get the money to the Contras. Despite all this turmoil surrounding his administration, President and Mrs. Reagan spent a quiet Thanksgiving secluded on their California ranch. The President has remained silent on the Iran-Nicaragua arms connection, but anonymous administration sources are saying tonight that the President was regularly briefed on Oliver North's actions. But the sources did not know whether those meetings touched on the funneling of profits from the arms sale to the Contra rebels. The Michigan labor movement has lost one of its top leaders. State AFL-CIO President Sam Fishman died this afternoon in a Washington, D.C. hospital after undergoing emergency heart surgery. Fishman was elected to the union's presidency in 1983 after serving as director of the UAW's Community Action Program. He was also active in both state and national Democratic Party politics. The AFL-CIO Executive Council will now meet to decide who will finish Fishman's term, which ends next May. On the roads and freeways across the country tonight, a relatively safe holiday. Nationally, only 72 people have been reported killed in traffic accidents, with two of those here in Michigan. One of our state's victims was a Dearborn Heights woman who was struck and killed by a car while she was walking in Westland late last night. Well, a Novi man has plenty to be thankful for this evening. A very close call for him today could have turned out much, much worse. But quick thinking and good timing kept his Thanksgiving a happy one. I looked down, saw the schoolyard here, and made a, made a quick turn, uh, lining myself up for the field, and at the same time trying to get the thing to, to run, which I had no success, so we put it down, just put it down in the field. 28-year-old Wayne Walker, a pilot for 12 yeah. years, was five minutes into his flight from the New Hudson Airport on his way to a bird's-eye view of the Detroit Thanksgiving Day Parade when his engine quit. A cable came loose cutting off the fuel supply, forcing him to land in a field right next to Novi Woods Elementary School. Once on the ground, Walker managed to fix the problem, but then he needed some help to get back in the air. I was pretty well scared at the time, uh, but um, confident. Confident I would get it down, maybe not in a, in a, in a beautiful picture, but down in me, in me safe. I think that was the bottom line. Once out of the field, Walker was joined by a police escort to find his way to an impromptu takeoff strip on nearby 10 Mile Road. Quite a sight for onlookers, as you can imagine. So, two and a half hours after his forced landing, Walker was back in the air, but his plans to see the parade were dashed. The big event was all over by the time he took wing again. Well, while Wayne Walker missed the big event, an estimated 650,000 people turned out for the 60th edition of the Thanksgiving Day Parade down Woodward Avenue. There wasn't a cloud to be seen anywhere near the big event, just buckets and buckets of bright, warm sunshine. And everything went without a hitch. As our Shelley Seisler reports, it was probably the biggest and best parade Detroit has ever seen. <laughs> You couldn't have asked for a finer day. Temperatures hovering in the low 40s, blue skies and sunshine pouring down like a blessing on this, the 60th birthday of Detroit's Thanksgiving Parade. Are you having a good time, Matt? Hi, you lion! I guess he is. Yeah, he's having a wonderful time. Leaving homes filling with the aroma of turkey dinner, some 650,000 people bundled up the babies and carted off the kids to head downtown and witness some 30 floats, a dozen giant lofty balloons, 
and 17 bands marching down Woodward Avenue, a trip everyone said was well worth the effort. This is the first time I've ever been. Is it better than watching it on TV? Yeah. It's, it's neat to be out here. I was coming for Thanksgiving here to the United States because I wanted to see the parade. Are you enjoying it? Yeah, of course, I enjoy it. It's uh, real exciting. The weather's gorgeous. Everyone's smiling. It's a good feeling. It's Detroit showing its best. Not hard to believe on a day like today. The people in the parade enjoyed themselves as much, if not more, than the spectators. Even if it's their... Tenth one. Tenth. How's this one stack up? Best of all. Each one gets better. Weather's pretty nice this year. Oh, beautiful. I'm glad you came along with that nice weather. It's great. Last year, you know, it was kind of cold and rainy, so this is a pleasant surprise. A Detroit institution, the Blue Pigs helped sing in the holiday season, led down Woodward by a trio of the wackiest grand marshals ever, Daffy Duck, Bugs Bunny, and Sylvester the Cat. And Detroit letter carriers peruse the curb, giving special delivery attention to the only mail that matters today. You put Santa on there. Happy Thanksgiving. Okay, good. Well, Gotten a lot of mail for Santa Claus? We're getting more and more every day, and each and every one is going to be answered. Going to make sure it gets right to them? Oh, it's going to get there. Believe me, it will. Michigan's finest, on horseback or on roller skates. So many things to see. But the site everyone looked for, the best, was saved for last. Flown in direct from the North Pole by Reindeer Express, that jolly old man in the red suit stopped off to receive the key to the city from Governor James Blanchard before beginning the most hectic time of a very busy schedule. One, two, three! The bands, the floats, the organization, the weather, it just couldn't have been any better. Parade organizers are going to have a tough time copying this year's event. But from the looks of this picture-perfect day, I'd say anything's possible. Happy Thanksgiving from the Thanksgiving Day Parade. I'm Shelly Seisler, TV 50 News. Well, now, while Detroit loves a party, Thanksgiving, of course, is a special day set aside to enjoy the company of friends and family and to reflect on all the good things that have come our way in the past year. Many of us just take it for granted that there will be plenty to be thankful for as we sit down to that holiday spread. But for those of us who are down on their luck, it's a different story, as our Margo Williams reports. This isn't the traditional Thanksgiving dinner most Americans can relate to, but for those who waited in a line that at times extended out the door, the Cabbage and Soup Kitchen family is the only one they know. I'm very thankful that we got places like this. There's a lot of hunger in Michigan, but I'm really thankful to be here. Where would you be if you weren't here? <laughs> I'd probably be at home just, just sitting around doing nothing. Hungry. I don't have a family to be with on Thanksgiving. And I'm here because this is the only way I can get a Thanksgiving meal. Don't interfere with the meal. The Cabbage and Soup Kitchen volunteers served over a thousand people today, a couple of hundred more than most other days. The Cabbagens provide daily meals and emergency clothing to the needy. Many are happy the soup kitchen exists and are thankful for today's meal, but it's the future they have to be concerned about. This gap could actually get so severe that there's really no hope left for the poor other than to come to places like this, and uh, that's not what we're about. We want to be able to help people ultimately help themselves. There are a number of young people here, uh, which is surprising. Uh, they've not been able to get into the job market because it's simply not open for unskilled, untrained people. Donations to the Cabbage and Soup Kitchen have been good this year, and with Christmas coming, the Soup Kitchen can always use more food and more volunteers. The Cabbage and Soup Kitchen has also provided over 800 food packages for families. It's a day that many have to be thankful for. In Detroit, Margo Williams, TV 50 News. Still ahead on the 10 o'clock news tonight, an historic event in the Battle Weary Phil uh, Philippines as the government and communist rebels work to settle their differences. We'll bring you with a report of an amazing breakthrough in the early detection of one of our deadliest diseases, a major step toward treatment. A startling revelation about the final hours of an English king 50 years after his death. And it's happy Thanksgiving for an out-of-work truck driver. His cash flow is well into the black tonight. We'll explain and bring you much more information 
in a few moments. The Green Bay Packers legged out a win while the Lions were left for the turkey. Highlights later in sports. A new test to detect one of the world's deadliest diseases is being hailed tonight as a major medical breakthrough. Researchers say a highly sensitive blood scan may be able to find cancer in its earlier and most treatable stages. This technique was developed at Boston's Beth Israel Hospital and appears to fulfill a long-time goal of cancer research. That is, pinpointing a clear and measurable difference between people who have cancer and those who do not. But scientists caution us that much more research is needed before it's determined whether this test can be used to screen healthy people for cancer. On January 20th, 1936, King George V, grandfather of Queen Elizabeth II, died, officially of bronchial congestion complicated by a weak heart. Now, 50 years later, we learn that the alien king's death was speeded along by his personal physician, Lord Dawson. Dawson's biographer has uncovered the doctor's memoirs in which he details the ruler's final hours. Dawson admitting he used injections of morphine and cocaine with the approval of the royal family to hasten the king's death, and that he timed the monarch's demise to ensure that the news would make the morning newspapers. An historic occasion today in the embattled Philippines where government and communist negotiators have signed a ceasefire agreement, the first in 17 years of fighting. The pact comes three days short of a government-imposed deadline, and it doesn't go into effect until December 10th. But only hours after it was signed, sporadic fighting was reported. Significant differences still stand in the way of a permanent accord, including a rebel demand that the government close the big U.S. military bases in the Philippines. Steve Pagan of Southern Florida can be especially thankful this holiday evening. Pagan was one of two dozen radio listeners who won the chance to win up to $1 million in cash. He had the right key that opened a special safe containing those million bucks, mostly in $1 bills. All he had to do was run in and scoop up the money with his hands, as much as he could carry out in 1 minute, 45 seconds. He didn't get the million, but he did manage to grab $16,188. It only took eight trips to the vault. And here's why Steve is especially thankful. As an unemployed truck driver, Pagan recently had to file for bankruptcy. And the money he grabbed is just enough to pay off his debts and start over again. Happy Thanksgiving, Steve. Well, Ray, it's not a happy turkey day for our lions up in the Silverdome. It turned out to be a real turkey shoot, for sure. And if Steve could tackle, the lions could use him because the lions could have used a tackler on the last play when they gave up that touchdown to Green Bay. We'll talk about it in just a minute. Sports with Ray Lane, brought to you by Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer. What'll you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. Well, that Thanksgiving Day game at the Silverdome had offense and more offense. But all the losses the Tigers or the Lions have had this season, today's had to give you a real heartburn. The Packers overcame a 10-point deficit in the last five minutes and beat the Lions 44-40. to The Packers were leading 23-13 just before the first half ended. Ferguson was having a great day. In fact, he had a great day. This one to Chadwick, and the point after made it 23-20. The Packers on top by three. Go to the third quarter now. Eddie Murray tied it at 23 all on this field goal. And everything was going the Lions' way. At least they were back in the ball game for sure. Just a short time later, Ferguson to Giles. And everything was really clicking. Point after was good. Lions on top, 30-23. The Packers then started playing giveaway, a bad snap, and the Lions recovered. Boy, they really had it going, didn't they? Just a couple of plays later, Ferguson found Bland in the end zone, and the Lions were up by 14. Now, the Packers had other thoughts. Right to Stanley, and the steamer goes all the way. No problem, Lions up by seven, going to the fourth quarter. And again, the Pack playing giveaway. Galloway on the interception, gets almost into the end zone, pulls up and tackled just around the five-yard line. The Lions could get only the Murray field goal after that interception, but it's okay. 40-30. Hang on now, fans. Here we go. First, a costly mistake by the Lions defense coming up. Somebody forgot their man out here. And he's on his way. No, he's not going to go for a touchdown. But hang on. He sets it up. And the Packers are on their way, really, capped off by this little swing pass for the touchdown. Okay, time is running out. We've got about a minute left, so don't worry. But the Lions are forced to punt with about a minute left. And Stanley was there. Watch some of the quick moves he makes right now, starting out. Oops, reverses his field. He's on his way. He may go all the way. He is going to go all the way. 83 yards with a winning score, 44-40, as the Lions were left with just, oh, just the dressing. 
at Dallas, the Seattle Seahawks were just too much for uh, Dallas today, 31-14. Craig on the passing end, Largent on the receiving end as the Seahawks scored the first four times they had the ball. A turkey day for hometown Dallas fans. In college football tonight, top-ranked Miami having no problem with East Carolina. The Hurricanes leading 29-10 in the fourth quarter. And even though Vinny Testaverde was not a quarterback, the Hurricanes still had passing from backup, and that is Jeff Peretta hitting Irvin on the second TD of the game. Bragging rights for the state of Texas. In the third quarter, Texas A&M 3, Texas 3. That game in the rain is the Aggies. Big favorites are finding the going tough. Some great hitting on both sides. And finally, just before the half ended, A&M tied it up 3-3. Well, after their third straight loss to Toronto last night, the Detroit Red Wings had this holiday off. The Wings have the St. Louis Blues at Joe Louis tomorrow evening. And after a week off, the Detroit Pistons return to work tomorrow night at the Silver Dome. The Milwaukee Bucks again provide the opposition. And as a bonus, the San Diego Chicken will be on hand to please or displease a lot of people. University of Michigan's basketball team next game, Monday night, Ball State at Chrysler Arena. Central Michigan should give them a pretty good test on Wednesday. And guess who was in New York today? A fellow by the name of Jack Morris talking to George Steinbrenner. Oh. And you don't think he's looking for a few million bucks in a long-term contract? No. I think so. Uh-uh. No, <laughs> he's not going to leave Detroit. We I hope. Hope you had a good holiday. Yes, I did. All right. Thank you, Ed. Well, as we wind down from our Thanksgiving activities, what better way to get into the Christmas spirit than make a stop at the Riverview Ballroom at Cobo Hall? From now through December 2nd, the ballroom is transformed into a holiday fantasy land to benefit Children's Hospital of Michigan. The Festival of Trees includes 100 evergreens, professionally decorated by professional designers, and a gingerbread village to delight the kid in all of us. Well, here you are, Thanksgiving night, and if you haven't decided what else you might do this holiday weekend, entertainment editor Elliot Wilhelm is here with some suggestions. Well, Glenn, you might call the long Thanksgiving Hollywood, uh, holiday weekend the opening gun in the traditional Christmas season race to capture your box office dollars. It's also the time when parents look for movies that the entire family can enjoy together, which explains the number of G and PG rated movies now arriving on Detroit area screens. Walt Disney's Song of the South was a pioneering experiment in combining live action with animation. The picture was immensely popular when it was first released in 1946, but because of the controversial nature of the Uncle Remus character, Song of the South was withdrawn from distribution throughout most of the 1970s. Now it's back on the big screen again as Disney's Thanksgiving offering, and audiences can judge for themselves if the picture is indeed packed with racial stereotypes or is simply a charming American folktale. The same Tyler. might be said for an American tale, which was designed and directed by a defector from the Disney Studios named Don Bluth and was produced by Steven Spielberg. The animated feature tells the story of the emigration of the Mouskowitz family to the United States a century ago. They left the old country because vicious cats were persecuting them. And Mr. Mouskowitz was a firm believer that there were no cats in America. An American Tale is a beautifully drawn and animated film, but the characters are hopelessly flat, and the predictable story contains remarkably few surprises. If small children are going to make much sense out of an American Tale, a crash course on racial prejudice will have to be provided by parents. Finally, there is Star Trek IV, a movie beyond criticism for Star Trek fanatics, and a movie that might seem fresh and original to young children. The picture features an ecological save the whales message and brings the crew of the Starship Enterprise back in time from the 23rd century to 1986 San Francisco, producing some predictably cute clashes in cultural habits. The only choice we're given is how many megatons? Am I stopping that damn noise? And I say screw you! And I hope you're blue too! Of all the entertainment to be found at the movies this weekend, Star Trek IV is probably the one film that everyone in the family from ages 7 and up can enjoy together. Just one warning, the first 20 minutes may be totally confusing if you haven't seen the first three Star Treks, so be sure to take a kid along with you in case you need to be briefed on the storyline. With the uh, first, second, and third Star Treks, and now the fourth, are we going to see a fifth? If they keep making money the way this one is, you will see a fifth. Undoubtedly. Okay, Elliot, have a great holiday you night. You too. 
Well, if it's another holiday away from the office for you tomorrow, you may not want to spend the entire day shopping indoors. We'll get the weather forecast from Paul Gross as this holiday edition of the 10 o'clock news moves right along in a few moments. <laughs> Well, of course, thousands of people enjoyed the parade down Woodward today, and we can't say it was a turkey of a day, much to the contrary. Oh, only for the turkeys. It was just a beautiful day, and would you believe we have a couple of more coming for you? Wonderful. Oh, it looks great. Outside right now, we have clear skies, 34 degrees and falling, relative humidity 92%, a southwesterly breeze at 12 miles per hour, and if you combine that wind speed with the temperature, that gives you a wind chill of 19 degrees. That's how it feels outside, and the pressure is falling. Well, across the rest of the state right now, as you can see, temperatures mainly in the 30s. The cool spots, Lansing and Flint, both at 33 degrees. We are not far behind. And look at the warm spot. Oddly enough, 42 degrees up at Houghton Hancock. Here's the U.S. satellite picture for you. And you can see lots of clouds down to our south. A lot of moisture streaming on in, but that's going to stay to our south, and we don't have to worry about it, thank goodness. Here's another front back to our northwest. That's a dry front. No rain with it whatsoever. So once this front does pass on through tonight and tomorrow, it's really not going to affect our weather all that much. In fact, if you'll notice, there's a very narrow corridor of clear skies right here. They extend all the way into New England, all the way back down to the plains, and to the far southwest, where, as you can see in California, the coast is clear. As we close in now from the satellite, you can see around here it looks precarious, but trust me, only a narrow band of clear skies right here, but the predominant steering winds aloft are carrying these clouds just north of east. So this area of fair skies right here should pretty much hang on in force overhead, and if you're doing any traveling around the region tomorrow, it looks great. No real travel problems. This front's going to sit right to our south. But again, it's a dry front. No real weather with it. You may see a few clouds drifting on through from time to time. But certainly we'll have more than our fair share of sunshine during the day tomorrow. On Saturday, pretty much the same story. The front's staying to our south. Sunday, the only problem day in the weekend. The front's going to start coming on back. There is moisture with this return from the front. Could see a few showers Sunday. But the bottom line is, after three straight beautiful days, who's going to complain? Here's the forecast for you and me for tonight. We're looking at mostly fair skies. Just a nice crisp start to the day. Tomorrow we'll see temperatures by morning dropping down to about 28 degrees. Then for your day tomorrow, we're looking at mostly sunny skies. Temperatures in the upper 40s to near 50 degrees. Mostly sunny again on Saturday, thank you, with temperatures up again near 50, perhaps pushing the low 50s. And on Sunday, mainly cloudy, maybe a little sunshine to start with showers developing and temperatures dropping off into the mid-40s. But three in a row in November, let alone on a holiday. Oh, hey, Paul, it'll give everybody a chance to get out there and jog off. Break a few leaves. Thanksgiving turkey and dressing. Certainly. Okay, Looks thanks good. a lot. Sure. Well, tomorrow, the U.S. will make its long-anticipated break with the SALT II agreement. A B-52 bomber equipped with cruise missiles will go into service, violating the unratified treaty with Moscow. And the day after Thanksgiving, of course, is the biggest shopping day of the year. We'll bring you these stories and much more information tomorrow night on Metro Detroit's 10 o'clock news. So warm up your credit card and checking count. Make sure everything's all in order and get out there and join the holiday shopping fray. We hope you had a happy Thanksgiving, everyone. We'll see you again tomorrow night. Good night.